Hi folks, I'm Larry Sterling, and you may recognize my name because I am the author of the Davis-Sterling Act. Well, I really am so glad to have you on the show today, and I would love, if um, Larry, if you would talk a little bit about the history of the Davis-Sterling Act and share with our residents kind of how that came about and um, a little bit of insight from your perspective. Well, I'd be glad to. I, I believe it was 1985 that the uh, bill was uh, put through the legislature, and it, the idea had, <coughs> pardon me, had been suggested to me by Professor Catherine Rosenberry of Cal Western Law School in San Diego. Professor Rosenberry has since gone on to be not only a national authority but an international authority on com common interest subdivisions. But at the time that I met her, I was a city council member on the San Diego City Council, and she was representing various environmentally sensitive clients uh, in front of the city council. And she's an amazing woman, very attractive, very intelligent, and very smart when it comes to land use issues. Contrary to me, I knew nothing about land, land use issues since the day I walked out of the property class at uh, law school and, and uh, had some sense of the rule against perpetuities, and that was the last thing I knew. So Mrs. Rosenberry, once I was elected to the legislature, started uh, uh, needling me about the fact that the common interest subdivision laws in California needed to be cleaned up. And I just, uh, just dusted her off because I didn't know what a common interest subdivision law was. There was no particular political movement towards it, and uh, so it was just an idea that was floating around. In the meantime, the happenings up in Sacramento put me in a position to be able to hire a staff member and to chair what they call a select committee. A select committee is one that covers a, a uh, subject matter, criminal law, civil law, housing, streets, roads, air, uh, waste, any, any subject that the legislator can think of. And it's a privilege to get one of these committees. And so uh, Speaker Willie Brown gave me one of those committees. He liked something I did, and he rewarded me for it. It's the way it works up there. Mm. And so he said, put in a proposal, Larry. So I did. I put in a proposal on, on fighting crime in California. In those days, the crime rate was out of sight, and I was very concerned about it. I used to work for the San Diego police. And so I put in a proposal to clean up the crime in California, hoping to ride this crest all the way to the President of the United States. Oh. And uh, <laughs> the Speaker got my proposal. He read it over, and he put denied on the cover. He said this is uh, covered by the Penal Code Committee, of which there was one another select committee. So I had to come up with a different subject. So I came up with another subject and a thoughtful analysis and a proposal, budget and all that kind of stuff. Sent that in, denied. This is covered by the little Hoover Commission and denied. And there are four or five of those denials. Finally, in frustration, I struck out denial and I wrote in common interest subdivision, sent it back. He wrote approved. And I had to call Mrs. Rosenberry and say, <laughs> exactly what is a common interest subdivision now? And she explained to me, and she was nice enough and professional enough to take a, what academics call a sabbatical, a year off from Cal Western Law School where she was full professor. And she became the staff member to the select committee. And uh, essentially she wrote the bill. She met with all the interest groups, the financiers, the bankers, the CAI members, the developers, anybody that the Department of Real Estate anybody that had an interest in this body of law and wrote up the bill. Now, she knew what she was doing. I was mindless of all this, a typical legislator. We have thousands of problems and too few solutions. And so since she was competent, she was doing the work, she took care of it all. And one day she shows up and she's got a bill. And so I introduced the bill at her request. That makes her the sponsor in legislative parlance. So I'm the author, she's the sponsor. Governor Davis at that time had nothing to do with the bill at all. Right. So we introduced the bill. She has now done her homework, not only with the stakeholders, but also with the legislators. She's lobbied the bill, and there are no no votes in the assembly. No no votes in the assembly. There were a couple amendments, so that made the bill have to come back to the assembly for concurrence. Gray Davis, who I had known for many years as Jerry Brown's chief of staff, uh, had been elected to the assembly. He got the chairmanship of the housing committee. As a courtesy, we took the bill into Chairman Davis and said, this is the bill, this is what it's about. And he said, I don't think this bill's going to pass my committee. So, Gray, it's passed both houses already. It's just you're in concurrence. What possibly could be your objection? He says, well, your name's on the bill. Mm -hmm. Well, putting the name, author's name on a bill is different than the author. It's called a tombstone. 
Uh, for example, when, when uh, Sam Farr, Henry Mello, and, and uh, Gwen Moore tombstoned a bill on marijuana reform, it was called the Far More Mellow Act. <laughs> so it gave you an idea what the bill, bill was about. Anyway, so I said, oh, I'll take my name off. And he said, no, that won't do it. So I said, so it has to be the Sterling Davis Act? And he says, no. Oh, dear. And being slow-witted, I finally, that's how it became the Davis Sterling Act. That's how it got written. That's how it got enacted. And that was over 25 years ago. And uh, it's been the body of law in this uh, subject matter ever since. I, I just wanted to point out the bill had three purposes when originally enacted. Yeah. One was to draw together pieces of laws that impacted homeowner associations that were distributed throughout various portions of the code. So we wanted to draw them together, number one. Number two, they then once drawn together, they had to be harmonized. They had to agree with each other. And, and before that, homeowners boards had been faced with this law says one thing and another law says another and then they're at risk, whatever they do. So we, she harmonized the law. And the third thing was we wanted to make sure that homeowner associations could be successful. That is, that they could collect the funds due to them and that then they had an obligation to spend it in a way that maintained the facilities so that we wouldn't have thousands of basically slums, uh, unfunded slums around the state that would require a bailout by the state legislature. Right. Already in those days, uh, they had trouble balancing the budget and having to bail out uh, through redevelopment efforts, uh, homeowners associations that had neglected their maintenance uh, problems was was a key challenge, mm -hmm. and so that's the three purposes of those bills uh, of the bill was to accomplish those three things, which is exactly what we accomplished. And for several decades, the homeowner associations were able to thrive under that, having the power to gain their revenues as necessary and the obligation. Uh, to forecast their expenses. And I really appreciate you being here and sharing your, your history and your wealth of knowledge on this issue with our residents. My pleasure. Wendy. Thanks for coming. Yeah, best wishes.